Hello again, everyone. Hope everybody is still staying safe and healthy out there. See, I told you we wouldn't be as long getting the contents of this episode put together and uploaded. This third episode of Thoughts in History from the Centenarian with Dell Dyer will cover Dell's college years, the struggles of college life during the Great Depression, his formative years in the ROTC, and his early days of civilian flight training. So sit back and enjoy. Welcome everybody, and, and um, glad you're with us again today. Today we'll be discussing Dell's college years, more about his ROTC training, and his commission during World War II. Well, Pop, so now we've gotten through the um, high school years, and you've gone off to college, and uh, during college, um, you you joined the ROTC. Now, was that a requirement during that period of of time, or was that something you, that you just voluntarily did, was join the ROTC? Well, to answer that question, uh, that was back when colleges uh, all over the country, well, they were ROTC colleges, state, uh, state schools like Athens is in Georgia, was in Georgia, and, and Kansas State, and all the states had ROTC. And uh, if you went to the school, if you were physically able, uh, the, all the men uh, had to take ROTC for two years. That was required. And uh, if you took it for four years, you could have a chance to become a, a officer in in service in ROTC. Of course, uh, at, the, at, at that time uh, that we were getting close into war, and the draft had been organized and so forth, and everybody was being drafted. Uh, if, if your number come up, I'm gonna back up just a little bit and tell of an incident. When I was in gram uh, grade school, grammar school, I was a country kid and uh, went to, I had, uh, we were only eight months in, in grammar school and the town school had nine months. Well, after our school would be out, uh, I'd beg my mother and dad to let me go and visit my cousin that went to town school and spend a day with them and go to school with them for one day. And of course, the uh, mother would say, well, just don't get in any trouble while you're in, there in town school. Well, I'd try to promise her I wouldn't. But anyway, <laughs> when you got there to school uh, and you had recess and noon and recess again, and uh, they found out that you, could, you were a country kid at recess for entertainment, they would choose a one of their fighters, and you you were just was defending yourself, and that was the entertainment for a town kid and a country kid to have a fight. So uh, I I got into fights about every time I went to went to visit school, <laughs> and one of the fellows that I had one of the roughest fights with. Uh, was Jack Young? He was a t he was attended the town school. Well, after high school and went to college, he called me up and wanted to know if I'd be his roommate in college that first year. I told him yes. We had to, we wasn't masked to each other. It was <laughs> yes. just part of the entertainment at that time to have a fight. But boy, we had a deli that time <laughs> and. Uh, we were good friends in college, but then after the first year, I joined the fraternity, uh, Delta Sigma Phi, and he joined, I think, another uh, fraternity. Uh, I don't remember. I think he finished college. I'm not right sure whether he continued on and, uh, all the way through college or not. Anyway, we all we physically could pass the uh, requirements. Uh, we uh, were in an ROTC. In ROTC, we had a, they had two organizations, or, or uh, honorary organization, Scabbard Blade, and, and uh, I forgot, uh, that was for the infantry, and, uh, and then the engineers had a, another organization. 
Maybe I'll think of it anyway. The scavern blade, we had to go through initiation. We had to have a broomstick or something that if we assimilated to, we had to carry around in a, uh, on our shoulder, march from place to place and stand uh, on duty at different places for so long. And we had to wear a certain type of a cap and we had to do square meals. And when we ate, and uh, they had all kinds of uh, things they did for our initiation. But uh, it, it was uh, interesting, and all this is recorded in the, the school annuals I've got and the, the, the different organization that I belong to. Again, I uh, joined the, the fraternity, and uh, my job in the fraternity uh, on Sunday I took the house mother, which the fraternities and sororities, they had a house mother usually, and our mother Morganson was our house mother, and I was assigned to take her to church every Sunday. Well, I sang in the, the school uh, chorus, and I sang in the, the boys' glee club in, in college of the, all four years. It happened to be that the, the head of the music department was also the choir leader at the uh, Methodist church that, uh, that we attended. So if we felt like we were at home with him uh, also directing our, uh, the church choir as well as the, the glee club and, and the chorus group. And one year we'd sing a Christmas oratorio and, and the other year we'd sing a, the Messiah. It, it was quite a production. It was a very uh, enjoyable time getting to uh, escort uh, our house mother to church every Sunday. And she was a very uh, lovely lady and we all thought an awful lot of her. Well, anyway, uh, <clears throat> one of the incidents uh, there in the fraternity house uh, it was the, near the end of the school year in the spring and the weather had turned nice and the city of Manhattan, Kansas had just built a new swimming pool and uh, it, it hadn't had a facial opening yet uh, but uh, some of the boys said that they had they, they had the water in, in the pool and we were all studying for final exams at the end of the year, and it was hot that night. Somebody come into the room and says, hey, uh, a few of us are going down to the swimming pool and, and jump in that swimming pool and cool off. You wanna go along? So I says, well, why not? And we had to walk down there and it was about a mile and a half from our fraternity. We walked down there and it probably was getting 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night when we got down there. They had a six foot fence around the <coughs> swimming pool and uh, we uh, all f climbed up over that fence and uh, in on with the pool there and it, there was no lights on, but there was lights in the park where the swimming pool was. And uh, it was almost uh, dark, but not completely dark. So we got in on the, uh, the uh, walkways inside and, and uh, we stripped off our clothes and we started uh, jumping in and, and uh, it wasn't quite full, but almost full. And we were swimming around there and all at once we heard some fellows come through the, the bathhouse and they hollered at us, says, you're under arrest going swimming in this swimming pool tonight. Well, I, I grabbed my clothes and threw them over the fence and I climbed up over that six foot fence and on the outside, the other boys got out of the pool, but they, they hadn't had time to grab their things. And they, they got uh, <laughs> uh, taken to the city uh, police station and uh, I got home uh, back to the fraternity that night, and uh, they asked me, the rest of the boys asked me, well, where's your 
the, all the U.S. fellows, and I said, they're down at the police station. <laughs> they wanted to know all the details, and I told them about it. Uh, they made them stay there all night at the police station. They didn't put them in, in jail, but they made them stay in there and made them promise that they wouldn't go back over there. And while they had them there at the police station, a bunch of high school kids went over and went into the pool, and they got caught. Well, they put all these folks on. They had to do some special duty for the city uh, on weekends, and <laughs> they were not too happy with me because I didn't have to do that because I, I didn't get caught. <laughs> were these other bunch of boys, were they... Swimming in the nude, too? Yes. <laughs> so uh, that was just another experience in college. But uh, taking ROTC, uh, we'd have drills on Saturday morning. That was when we uh, they had a parade ground there. We'd be out there on that field uh, doing marches of all types and, and going through all procedures and and so forth, but we'd have several classes during the week of ROTC, military books that we had to go through and so forth and get acquainted with the procedures and all the rules and regulations of being in the service. Between the junior and senior year, uh, we was sent to summer encampment when the time, we were already home uh, for our summer break when the time was called for us to go to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, which is northwest of Kansas City, for our uh, summer encampment, six weeks encampment. And there we, we had tents and cots, and that place was absolutely covered up with mosquitoes, and we'd had, uh, we'd had to have mosquito netting uh, they at the, the head of the bed they had a T thing, and at the foot they had another T thing, and you had to put this netting over those two ends and uh, along the side, and then tuck the, the mosquito netting underneath of the mattress. But if you roll over against the mosquito netting any time during the night, mosquitoes would just right through that mosquito netting. They'd they'd uh, bite, bite you, you mm. and <laughs> you'd have, find places where you just read where they'd chewed on you during the night. Was was you was y'all staying in tents? At we were time? sleeping in tents. Tents. Uh, they I think there was six or eight of us in a tent. And, Must have been uh, big big tents then. Yeah, and that's the only time that I ever p- pulled KP in in the service. Uh, assigned one day, and that was the day that they had a 25-mile march. When you're on KP, they get you up about 3 o'clock in the morning, you're preparing your breakfast for them, and then you work during the day. You might have a little bit of a time in the afternoon that you could rest for a little, uh, for an hour or two after you'd finished the noon meal. Then at the time you cleaned up at night, it would be 11 or 12, um, 10 or 11 o'clock at night, the time you finished up. So you'd had your full day that evening, it, it being uh, in the summertime, the long days, and they come marching in about 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night on that 25 mile march they had. And I, I missed that march. But uh, that that was all right with me, uh, but you always uh, missed all the fun then, didn't you? Yeah, I missed all the fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but this this is still during your college years in ROTC. Yes, between junior and senior year. Yeah, uh, that was a, a summer encampment they call it. Well, backing up to a another thing that you had touched on before, you had uh, talked about flying and uh, explain to everyone um, how you got into flying. Uh, was that in high school or was that in college that you no, started that taking was, flying lessons? That was my last year in college, uh, senior year in college, and the government had to program a CPT, civilian pilot training, 
uh, we were we were not in war when I went into it, uh, but uh, that was in '41 uh, when war Pearl Harbor was hit, December of '41, seventh. So we were already taken civilian pilot training. My dad had uh, told me he he was very well versed. He would listen to the radio and <clears throat> and uh, got all the information he could get. And he says we we're going to get into war with Europe because it was, it was really England was they had their backs to the wall, because Germany was getting ready to invade England, and we were trying to help England. They were the only thing left over there in the Europe that had, that Hitler hadn't taken over. And anyway, Dad told me he says, uh, you get all the training you can get because. You're, you're very apt going to have to go to war. So that, that's the reason I got into pilot training. I love to fly. We didn't get paid much when we was working on the farm. Dad promised me one summer that, that if I'd uh, work hard and, and do certain things and, uh, on the farm, that uh, he'd uh, pay for me taking a flight up at Wichita, Kansas, and get to go up in the air. And I did. And, I guess the first time I went had flown a Ford trimotor airplane in on a pasture a mile north of Clearwater. I had an opportunity to take a flight in the in that Ford trimotor, just about ten fifteen minute flight, just a short flight in it. So that was I guess my first flying, and then uh, I flew up up at Wichita at the regular airport there, uh, which is now McConnell Field in Wichita. Mm. It was the old airport. Anyway, college was, uh, uh, well, when I first went up to college, and we were, Dad just uh, was scraping the barrel to try to afford me in college, and my tuition was less than $300 for the year, the first year which is unbelievable when you think of what it is today. Yep. And uh, uh, I've stayed in the boarding house, and this this uh, Jack Young that I'd mentioned before, he and I were roommates. I had uh, $5 a month to spend and pay for, uh, that. I had to pay for uh, Sundays. We couldn't... Uh, uh, the boarding house was closed on Sunday and we, to have anything to eat. I, uh, I had a $5 money available that my dad gave me for eating, and I'd save enough money out of that $5 to go to the uh, movie once a month. Mm. And <laughs> we'd, we'd buy a quart of milk and, and a loaf of bread or some bananas or something, and that that would be all we'd eat on Sunday, mm. but we was eating in the boarding house. Uh, the other that was before I got into uh, had joined the fraternity, and <laughs> so it was pretty slim picking. And and oh yes, the college uh, at Manhattan, the total enrollment of the college in 1938 was 4,000 students. And believe it or not, I found out later that Georgia, University of Georgia, was almost the same size in population enrollment at the university in, in Athens, Georgia, at around 4,000 students in 1938. 38. So Georgia now is upwards of uh, Twenty-eight to thirty thousand, I think, and Kansas State's is uh, at last I'd heard around twenty-three thousand, twenty-four thousand. So it's bigger than Kansas State, but back a few years back, it uh, with the we found a an ad in the or a story in the paper that Kansas had more college graduates per population than any state in the union at that time. I don't know what it is today, but this was back in the 60s or 70s when that, that was published. 
the, the Kansas people were very energized by uh, higher education. They, they really went in for higher education at that time. And the farmers, Kansas State was a agricultural and an engineering school. Mm -hmm. Well, I started out business administration the first year, and that wasn't just what I wanted. So I changed to engineering and ended up agricultural engineering and uh, had really uh, hoped to get in as a county agent in one of the counties. But uh, they, when they graduated, it was only $200 a month is uh, what they offered college graduates at that time. And this uh, oil company and, and uh, Dallas, Texas, offered $225, and I, I went with a Texas oil company when I finally uh, got out well, of college. Well, basically, whenever you started, you started out in business administration, right? That's right. And you ended up in agricultural engineering, which, honestly, looking back now, you'd probably been better off staying in business administration because of what you ended up actually doing later on in life. <laughs> well, yes or no. Uh, but, uh, what what the, my plans was back then, being a, uh, an accountant, uh, take care of taxes and stuff like that, and just an office job. And that, that was, that's oh, not just, my cup of tea. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm not... Well, uh, I'm very satisfied with what uh, my life turned out. Uh, well, we're here at the end of uh, this segment. We've probably gone over actually a little bit, so we'll need to bring it to a close at this point. And we'll pick up towards the latter part of your college years and, and, um, and go from there into the start of the war whenever you got your commission after, since you took ROTC for almost four years and all. So, but we'll end it there. And we will pick up next time from that point on. All right. Thank you. Thanks again, everyone, for watching. And we will see you in the next episode of Thoughts and History from a Centenarian with Dale Dyer.